and welcome back to my channel. And if you're new here, welcome to my channel for the first time. My name is Dr. Kate Boyd. I'm a professor of piano at Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana. And this here is my teaching studio. Thank you for coming today to help me practice. And I can tell you, it's been quite a day. If you weren't here to practice with me, I would probably have just gone home and not bothered to do any more practicing for the day. So I'm really, really glad you're here because I really need to practice. Today I'm going to practice the fourth sonata for violin and piano by Beethoven and we're going to start off with the last movement today. as you just heard. There are a few spots that I've chosen to work on with you tonight. The first spot that I'm gonna look at is measure 21, which is right where I stopped. It goes like this. And then it continues. I just played it slowly for you so you would hear the contour. What I wanna do when I practice this is to show every time the notes go up and then reverse direction. So in other words, I want to kind of surge to the top and then I'm gonna start the next one a little quieter and then start quieter. I'm exaggerating that to show you the shapes that I'm trying to practice in. We want to avoid it being just totally straight or static like this. crescendo but we don't just want every note to be a fa uh, louder than the previous we don't want it to be like this because what is interesting musically about this is each musical gesture as it ascends we go to here and then we go and then we go and then so it becomes more and more exciting and we have to show that As you notice, it kind of hangs for a moment before, before it's ascending. So I'm going to practice that a couple times. And I, the other thing I want to avoid is an accent. I don't want to go... Right? I, I want to go to that note in a way that sounds organic from the previous notes. I have to also get the right fingering. It's a pattern that moves up, but doesn't just go as a scale, like what I just showed you, that kind of doubles back on itself and continues to go up. Think of ways to isolate the ascending part, and then notice where it changes direction, and then gathers itself for the, the, the next ascension. Okay, so that is that, set, that spot. I'm going to just play it once, um, kind of... Uh, at a normal tempo. Let's see if I can. <laughs> Etc. By the way, Pepper is here today. Uh, you can see her reflection in the mirror. She has a bone and she is very, very happy right now. Pepper is my standard poodle. She's uh, 11 years old. And sometimes she comes in and helps me practice too. Sometimes she even comes in and helps me teach, with the which the students really, really love. The next spot I want to talk to you about is measure 143. Basically, this piece is a rondo, like I said, and that first section that I played keeps coming back several times. It happens over and over with this. this. And then the violin has it with piano accompaniment. And then we have little interludes. I'm saying bapa, that's the violin playing. <laughs> and then wait for that, and then etc. This continues on. 
I don't need to really practice that. I just wanted to show you. Then there's this middle section that's kind of like a hymn. It's kind of like a chorale. The violin has a melody. It goes. Right, and then the piano has chords under it. So I'll play both of them together. This is the violin part plus the piano. chorale that goes back and forth. Violin has the first part, then the piano, then the violin, then the piano. That's all fine. As you heard, it's not hard. I don't need to spend a lot of time practicing it. However, this next part has a whole bunch of little triplets that are not that hard on the surface. But the reason I am practicing them and working on them now is because I changed my fingering today on it. So I need to reinforce that. I, I heard somewhere, uh, many times I've heard this from different places, and, I, and I, I don't know the actual scientific study for it, but I heard that it takes approximately 12 to 15 repetitions to learn something new. But if you learn something incorrectly and you want to relearn it and change it, it takes something like 45 repetitions. Whether or not those exact numbers are true, I have to say that it feels true because I learned this with different fingering and now I'm having to just go over and over and over it to reinforce the new fingering. do that a bunch of times. I'm going to repeat that five more times. So just grab a grab a book or a magazine. I'm going to repeat it four more times now. Three more times. Notice I'm practicing it hands together too. I want to get the coordination. How many more? Two more I think. this is that the triplets are not even the main part of the melody and so they have to be quite quiet and in the background so even after all that work they need to just kind of glide to the background at this point I'm, I'm doubling I'm playing a six below the violin it sounds like this right and then the piano has the right hand has the tune oops wrong fingering for you. First, be very careful and aware and mindful when you create your fingering. Write it in. It's written all over my music. And then if you change it, uh, change it in the music because that helps your eye and your hand stay coordinated because you see a number and you associate it with a, a, a kind of feeling more than a number itself. The second thing is, as I said earlier, you have to repeat it a lot if you make a change and be very aware of 
what finger you're actually using because a lot of times I see students um, think they're using one finger but they're not like they have something written but they're actually doing a different finger so what can be helpful with that is to say the numbers out loud while you play like this five three two one two one three four three one two three four two three four three two one two three four one two three four one two three four one two three one three four five one five A lesson for this is that this is really objectively not that hard. I'm currently playing all 10 of these Beethoven sonatas and this is one of the easiest spots, one of the easier places, but it's important not to underestimate the music you're playing even if it seems easy. Be patient when you practice, resist the urge to kind of tell yourself, oh I should know this, I should know this, and just kind of play it faster than you're comfortable because you're actually going to make faster progress if you play it slowly until you really get it and then start to naturally increase the tempo. I'm going to just play this section one more time kind of slowly and then I'm going to move on to another spot because you know what I'm going to be doing after I turn the camera off. I'll be practicing this spot. repeating it until I'm more comfortable with it over time. Part of the reason that I am not more secure with it is because I really have been focusing on the more difficult sections and the more difficult places and so now it's time for me to turn my attention to a place like this that I hadn't paid enough attention to before now. The next thing I want to talk to you about is that um, somebody left another question on yesterday's video, and I want to address that. I think it's Ethan. Ethan asked this question about how to move the fingers. Yes, yesterday I was talking about moving the fingers from this joint, which is called the MCP joint by, um, by people. And this is what I just call the third knuckle. <laughs> One, two, three. And if you think of the, the, hand, the fingers kind of flapping from this third knuckle, there, there's a kind of a free, a free way that the fingers move from that. And Ethan was asking about using these knuckles and kind of curling the finger. And I don't recommend focusing on playing the piano using a lot of curling of these joints. And the reason is because if you curl your finger, this, is, this uses the flexors on the bottom part of the forearm, but if you lift your finger like that, it uses the extensors, these muscles, on the top of your forearm. And so if you're curling your finger and lifting at the same time, you have two opposing muscle groups that are both trying to fire at the same time, and that is called co-contraction. And so you want to avoid putting muscles in conflict with each other. The other reason that curling with these knuckles while you're playing the piano and moving up and down with the fingers is because that can lead to the whole wrist tightening. And as we have discussed in some of my videos, the wrist, oh, actually, the wrist has two rows of bones 
and it acts as this kind of long, it's not a simple hinge, it's kind of a long constellation of bones that all move together. And that's why thinking of the fingers as dropping in from this knuckle here, this MCP, MCP joint, is good, but remember that the finger goes all the way back to the wrist. And so don't only think that the finger starts here. Remember the finger starts all the way back here. And so your finger can feel long. If you're really mapping it that way in your mind, that can be very, very helpful. And if you want more information, I wanna share with you this book that um, I really like. I got a lot of information from it, including this information. It's called What Every Pianist Needs to Know About the Body by Thomas Mark. It's a little bit geeky, right? It's a little like all about the muscles and the joints and everything. Um, but it's very well organized. And I was thinking actually of doing maybe a book review of this so that to kind of like give an overview of it. But either way, this is a good book. I'll put a link to it in the description. And Ethan, I hope that answers your question about the reason that I don't advocate curling the finger, but talk a lot about playing freely from the finger. So I'm going to just play this, this main theme. I'm just tapping. I feel, I feel my, my fingers just tapping from that joint. I'll show you a section of the piece where I kind of do a lot of this kind of motion. It's measure 223. Well, I personally, I mean, I, I know some people play with quite curled fingers, but but it, it's, a, for me, more efficient. I played the wrong number of repetitions, but you get the idea. Same thing. I'm, I'm moving really from here. And I'm not curling this way as I play. I'm not going like this. with the arm moving a little bit. A good way to practice a section like this, by the way, is with blocked chords, so. Another way to practice something like this is to practice all the ups, so like this. Every time it goes up. slower too. I don't want to hit that, I don't want to hit that A, do I? So I'm going to just finish this so, so that you can actually hear it played with the correct notes. <laughs> question part where we go and do all this kind of fun stuff and a lot of fun stuff happens and then it kind of ends I'll just play the end for you now remember I'm going all the silences are the violin playing so it kind of makes a continuous thing this is the piano but I'll just play the piano instruments come down. It, there's a, a kind of a sinister or a dark quality to it at the end. Now I'm going to tell you about my day. I said that every time I do, do one of these videos, I'm going to give you a little behind the scenes update. It's the last week of classes and things are pretty frenzied around here. There's a lot happening in the hallways, a lot of student activity. Somebody came by today to run their piece for me because we have student recital tomorrow night. All the students are getting ready for that. I tried two other times today to make this video. And the first time I tried to make it, what happened was 
next door to me is the horn studio and then they were playing a very loud concerto and i thought well i'll just make the video anyway but then i started and it was actually fairly distracting so i decided i wouldn't i wouldn't do that uh, and i would just wait then i was on the verge of recording it the second time after the horn players finished next door and i got a phone call from my husband and his car had broken down and so i went and got him and Pepper and got everything organized and got him where he needed to go, took his car, he got his car towed, et cetera, et cetera. And so that took about three plus hours out of my day. And so now it is Monday evening and I have finally made these, this video. And I'm very glad I did because I got a little bit more time to practice the last movement of movement four. Thank you so much for practicing with me today. And I will see you tomorrow when we will continue with the fourth sonata. See you then. Happy practicing.